Thank you very much, Dr. Brayman. Appreciate it. I'd like to thank Dr. Chapman for inviting me to come talk about this. Uh, it's a controversial topic, and I, I actually am um, going to avoid it largely. Um, I think before we talk about who we put liver transplants into, you need to remember what the goals of liver transplantation is. Uh, the, the goals of liver transplantation are to deliver timely, high-quality liver transplants to every patient on the list. And that requires good graft and patient survival, short wait to transplant, uh, minimal death on the wait list, and you would certainly hope that your results will improve with time and experience. So as uh, in the United States, how are we doing? Looking at SRTR data from uh, July of 2007 to June of 2008, there were just about 17,000 people on the liver wait list, just over 6,000 transplants, uh, deceased donor transplants, with an 83% one-year graft and 87% one-year patient survival. Uh, the 12, uh, there's a 12-month median wait for transplant, and there were almost 2,400 deaths on the wait list. And if you add it up, that's counting the people who die getting a transplant and the people who die waiting, that's 25% of the people on the list end up dying within a year. So to say that liver transplantation is a finished product, I think it's come a long way, but it's clearly not nearly uh, ideal yet. So I'm going to answer this question up front to end any suspense. I think you should not use livers that you don't think will work, and you should not transplant patients that you can't justify in terms of the benefit that the patient receives. The real question is, are we using marginal livers and low meld score recipients? And I'm going to answer that for our program in, in particular. Part one is, are we using marginal livers? And part two is, who should be transplanted in terms of ben receiving benefit? And, and really, at what point is it in the patient's best interest to receive a transplant? And how can we do better? So there are really two ways. We could broaden our uh, acceptance criteria for cadaveric organs so that we can perform more transplants, or we can find new sources of donor organs. I'm not going to talk about finding new sources. I think that's ultimately where uh, liver transplantation is really going to become an ideal therapy. So broadening acceptance criteria. Can we do this and still achieve good patient and graft survival? And are graphs that we accept with broadened criteria marginal? Before you can employ a strategy for your program to liberalize or broaden your criteria, you have to know your own data. So you have to be able to justify your practice patterns. You have to be able to change your practice as new information arises. And that means that you have to track your data very closely over time. And you have to be not far off from real time being able to explain to patients and insurers and to the rest of the transplant community what your results actually are. You need to strive to have results that are at least as good as the national average, and you should strive to have uh, improvement in your results with, with experience. And again, I'm going to tell you, as your results uh, change, you have to be able to adjust your practice. You have to know what your results are. Now, what constitutes a marginal donor? If you talk about the definition of marginal and you look up Wikipedia or Webster's Dictionary, it's close to the lower limit of qualification, acceptability, or function. And they talk about barely exceeding the minimum requirements. And my wife's here, but I'm going to say when they offer me some of these livers, I say my mother-in-law's not in town. But <laughs> all kidding aside, nobody would want to put this kind of an organ into somebody. So you really want to be careful about how we describe these organs. So when we say marginal livers, what are we really talking about? We're talking about livers that get turned down by most centers for transplant. People also talk about high donor risk index, uh, DRI greater than 1.7. But what you really need to think about is what factors adversely impact survival. And really, they're in the donor risk index, but older livers, prolonged ischemic time, donation after cardiac death, those are important uh, considerations. So if you look at our program, the DRI does apply to our results. Uh, if you look at the DRI under 1.5, the, there's very little difference between 1.5 and lower. As you get a higher DRI, the, the results decline. And you need to know that so that you can adjust your practices accordingly. And what I'm going to tell you is we do not use a lot of high DRI livers. Now, the impact of donor age on graft survival, if you look at under 40, uh, you know, 40 to 50, and then this is, this is the 60 and over range. That is, that's clearly worth survival. And so you have to adjust your practice. So we don't uh, generally go over 70 years of age for our, uh, for our donors. And I think that's on the conservative side. Um, but I, is, you have to adjust your practice. So it's not about telling your patient, I'm going to use something, and there's, I don't know if it's going to work or not. You have to adjust your practice. And you have to adapt and make these things work. DCD livers. This is 53, trans, 53 DCD livers, and that's uh, uh, it's just over 1,000 transplants. 
there is a decrease in graft survival. And if you look at the uh, patient survival, it's about the same. So you could say, well, the patient survival is about the same. But I, I have to say, we aren't happy with this difference in survival. So you have to adjust your practices, and you have to ratchet back what you do. So we've dropped our, minimum, uh, our maximum age. We've dropped our warm ischemic times that we're willing to accept. And we mix and match a lot more with uh, distance traveled and arrest times and age. So you, you have to adapt your practice to your results. Now, people talk a little bit about, we'll talk about what you tell patients. So CNS tumors. Um, CNS tumors are a category, there is a risk of donor transmission of the of glioblastomas. And so we've done, this is 26 for uh, 835, we're up over 35 now for the uh, 1,200 livers we've done. What I can tell you is the survival is the same uh, graft and patient survival. Uh, the issue is, is donor disease transmission. Currently, we have not had any uh, glioblastomas show up in our recipients. And so we can tell our patients that with 30-something cases, the, the survival's good. We have not had transmission. But what we tell them is we are overdue for, for a transmission. So it, it is going to happen at some point if you choose to use these graphs. And again, we pick who gets those, okay? We put them into people with older, very old people, that, that if they get three, four, five years, uh, the over 70 crowd, uh, we pick people with cancers that can't get exception points and don't have options. So you have to pick them carefully, and you have to discuss the risks with these people. Graph survival from HC, uh, Hep C positive donors. This is an interesting one, because when I first came to Indianapolis, and we talked about doing this, we had to go through a formal ethics review. Uh, we had to get the legal department, risk management involved. We have about a 30-page consent form for this. And what ended up happening is it's actually, this is 100 cases. That's about 1,100 cases. This is, it's better graph survival in the people that got the hepatitis C positive donors. And it's statistically significant. So when we used to tell them we think that, uh, the graft survival is okay, you'll get a liver faster. Now we tell them you're going to be lucky if you get a hep C positive donor. So again, you have, to, you have to adjust what you do and what you tell the people based on your results. Now, if you want to talk about marginal graphs or graphs that, we're talking about these graphs that clear the region, they clear uh, national wait list. This is 845 liver transplants, 600 of them are from local, uh, about 100 uh, is 